My name is Sam Bachnin, and I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. It is an open question whether frictionless markets are more efficient. Traders and investors need time to digest new information, incorporated in models and theories regarding the markets and specific securities, map out the full implications of recent developments, and decide how to act. We call this time-lapse friction, and it guarantees that players and agents act more or less rationally and consistently. In a frictionless market, panics, crashes and bubbles are far more likely, rendering it less efficient, not more so. Three of the most important functions of free markets are price discovery, the provision of liquidity and capital allocation. Honest and transparent dealings between willing buyers and sellers are thought to result in liquid and efficient marketplaces. Prices are determined second by second in a process of public negotiation, taking all and emergent information about risks and returns into account. Capital is allocated to the highest bidder, who, presumably, can make the most profit on it, and every seller finds a buyer and vice versa. Volatility is considered the most accurate measure of risk, and by extension of return, the flip side of risk. The higher the volatility, the higher the risk, the higher the reward. The volatility increases in the transition from bull to bear markets, and this seems to support this pet theory. But then how to account for surging volatility in plummeting stock exchanges? At the depths of the bear phase, volatility and risk increase, while returns evaporate, even taking short selling into account. That's a mystery, a paradox. The Economist has recently proposed yet another dimension of risk. Quote, The Chicago Board Options Exchange's VIX Index, a measure of traders' expectations of share price gyrations in July, reached levels not seen since the 1987 crash and shot up again a few weeks before the article. So over the past five years, says The Economist, volatility spikes have become ever more frequent, from the Asian crisis in 1997 right up to the World Trade Center attacks. Moreover, it is not just price gyrations that have increased, but the volatility of volatility itself. The market, it seems, now have an added dimension of risk, the volatility of volatility. Call writing has soared as punters, fund managers, and institutional investors try to eke an extra return out of the wild ride and to protect their dwindling equity portfolios. Naked strategies, selling options contracts or buying them in the absence of an investment portfolio or underlying assets, translate into the trading of volatility itself, and hence of risk. Precisely why naked trading has been banned in most Western markets after 2008. Short selling and spread betting funds join single stock futures in profiting from the downside. Market risk, also known as beta or systematic risk, market volatility, reflect underlying problems with the economy as a whole and with corporate governance, lack of transparency, bad loans, default rates, uncertainty, illiquidity, external shocks, and other negative externalities. The behavior of a specific security reveals additional idiosyncratic risks, and these are known as alpha risks. Quantifying volatility has yielded an equal number of Nobel Prize winners and controversies. The oscillation of security prices is often measured by a coefficient of variation within the Black-Scholes formula, published in 1973. Volatility is implicitly defined as the standard deviation of the yield of an asset. The value of an option increases with volatility. The higher the volatility, the greater the option's chance during its life to be in the money, convertible to the underlying asset at a handsome profit. So, without delving too deep into the model, this mathematical expression works well during trends and fails miserably when the markets change sign from bull to bear or vice versa. There is disagreement among scholars and traders whether one should better use historical data or current market prices, which include expectations, to
to estimate volatility and to price options correctly. In their book, The Econometrics of Financial Markets, by John Campbell, Andrew Lowe, and Craig McKinley, published by Princeton University Press in 1997, the authors write, Consider the argument that implied volatility is a better forecast of future volatility because changing market conditions cause volatilities to vary through time stochastically, and historical volatilities cannot adjust to changing market conditions as rapidly. The folly of this argument lies in the fact that stochastic volatility contradicts the assumption required by the BS model. If volatilities do change stochastically through time, the formula is no longer the correct pricing formula, and an implied volatility derived from the formula provides no new information, in effect. The BS formula is thought deficient on other issues as well. The implied volatilities of different options of the same stock tend to vary. Define the formula's postulate that a single stock can be associated with only one value of implied volatility. The model assumes a certain geometric, Brownian distribution of stock prices that has been shown to not apply to US markets, among many others. Studies have exposed serious departures from the price process fundamental to, uh, to Black Shores. Skewness, excess kurtosis, the concentration of prices around the mean, serial correlation, and time varying volatilities. Black Shores tackles stochastic volatility poorly. The formula also unrealistically assumes that the markets, a market dickers continuously, ignoring transaction costs and institutional constraints and many other things. No wonder the traders use BS as a heuristic rather than a price-setting formula. It's important to note that volatility also decreases in administered markets and over different spans of time, as opposed to the received wisdom of the random walk model, most investment vehicles sport different volatilities over, over different time horizons. Volatility is especially high when both supply and demand are inelastic and liable to large random shocks. This is why the price of industrial goods are less volatile than the prices of shares or commodities, for instance. But then, why are stocks and exchange rates volatile to start with? Why don't they follow a smooth evolutionary path in line, let's say, with inflation or interest rates or productivity or net, earning, net earnings or something, you know, real, of the real economy? Why volatility is so divorced from the real economy? Well, to start with, because economic fundamentals fluctuate, sometimes as widely as, as wildly as shares themselves. The Fed, for instance, had to cut interest rates 11 times in 12 months. Uh, and, and this to the lowest level in the last 40 years. Inflation gyrated from double digits to a single digit in the space of two decades. This uncertainty of market fundamentals of the real economy is inevitably incorporated in the price signal and yields volatility. Moreover, because of time lags in the dissemination of data and its assimilation in the prevailing operational model of the economy, Prices tend to overshoot both ways, overshoot and undershoot. The economist Rudiger Dernbusch, who died a few years ago, studied this in his seminal paper, Expectations and Exchange Rate Dynamics, published in 1975. He described the apparent national ebb and flow of floating currencies. His conclusion was that markets overshoot in response to surprising changes in economic variables. A sudden increase in the money supply, for instance, access interest rates and causes the currency to depreciate. The rational outcome should have been a panic sale of obligations denominated in the collapsing currency, but the devaluation is so excessive that people reasonably expect a rebound, in other words, an appreciation of the currency. And so what they do is they purchase bonds rather than dispose of bonds. Yet, even Dornbush ignored the fact that some price twirls have nothing to do with economic policies or realities, or with the emergence of new information. And they have a lot to do with mass psychology. Indeed, economics is a branch of psychology, in my view. How else can we account for the crash of October 1987? 
And this goes to the heart of uh, the undecided debate between technical and fundamental analysis. As Robert Schiller has demonstrated in his tones, market volatility and irrational exuberance, the volatility of stock prices exceeds the predictions yielded by any efficient market, market hypothesis, or by discounted streams of future dividends, or earnings, or by any model. But, uh, this finding is hotly disputed, but has been supported numerous times, in numerous studies. Some scholarly studies or, of researchers or scholar, of scholars such as Stephen Roy and Richard Porter offer support. Um, and others, no less weighty scholars, uh, likes of Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French and James uh, Poterba and Alan Clyden and William Schwert, negate uh, Robert Schiller's perception, mainly by attacking Schiller's underlying assumptions and simplification. But everyone, Opponents and proponents alike admit that stock returns do change with time, though for different reasons. Volatility is a form of market inefficiency. It is a reaction to incomplete information, to uncertainty. Excessive volatility, though, is irrational. The confluence of mass greed, mass fears, mass disagreement as to, as to the preferred mode of reaction to public and private information, this confluence yields price fluctuations. Changes in volatility, as manifested in options and futures premiums, are good predictors of shifts in sentiment and the inception of new trends in the market. Some tra traders are contrarians. When the VIX or the Nasdaq volatility indices are high, signifying an oversold market, they buy, and when the indices are low, they sell. Chaikin's volatility indicator, a popular timing tool, seems to couple market tops with increased indecisiveness and nervousness, in other words, with enhanced volatility. Market bottoms, boring, cyclical affairs, usually suppress volatility. Interestingly, Chaikin himself disputes this interpretation of his own work. He believes that volatility increases near the bottom, reflecting panic selling, and decreases near the top when investors are in full accord uh, as to market direction. But most market players simply follow the trend. The trend is your friend. They sell when the VIX is high and thus portends a declining market. A bullish consensus is indicated by a low volatility. Thus, low VIX readings signal the time to buy. Whether this is more than superstition or a mere gut reaction remains to be seen. There's not enough uh, researchers. There are not enough studies. It is the work of theoreticians of finance. Alas, these are consumed by mutual rubbishing and dogmatic thinking. The few that wander out of the ivory tower and actually bother to ask economic players and agents what they think and how they act, these few theoreticians of finance are much derided by their theoretical uh, uh, friends and colleagues. So it's a dismal sin. There is no creativity in it. And there is a fear of confronting reality, lest it might undermine the models that are so cherished. Time for a revolution. Time for volatility in the science of volatility.